Hello, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming for this uh, new museum talk. Today we welcome Theodore Trifon. Uh, Theodore uh, carries out environmental governance and political economy research here at the museum. He has published multiple books on the Congo, including uh, Congo's Environmental Paradox and Congo Masquerade. Uh, Theodore's current research focuses on uh, bushmeat, and so today he will uh, tell us more about the bushmeat economy in Central Africa, how it affects uh, wildlife populations, what the driving forces are, etc. So, Theodore, the yeah. floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Jonas. Thank you all for coming to Tiverne or coming from your offices to be here. So we're going to be talking about the culture and economy of eating wild animals in Central African cities. Huh? Well, my name is Theodore Trefon. I work in the Earth Sciences Department here in the Royal Museum for Central Africa, where I am the resident token social scientist in the Earth Science Department. Hmm. So the high-level research goal of this work is to contribute to international efforts at nudging behavior change in urban Central Africa to reduce the supply, trade, and consumption of bushmeat through social science analysis. So the three big things here are nudging because we're not going to change behaviors in a revolutionary way. It's going to take a lot of time. It's urban, so I'm not really talking about consumption in rural subsistence economies, which hasn't been a problem and isn't really a major problem. And it's social science analysis because much of this work to date has been carried out by conservation biologists and they realize that they haven't been able to really move ahead with the problem, which is why they're increasingly opening up to social science uh, contributions. I have to warn you that some of these images that I'm going to show you are not for the light of heart, so be prepared. Huh? You know, images like this are rampant in Central Africa. You have thousands of bushmeat markets. And here, this is only bushmeat. There's no, there's no cattle raising. There's very, very little domestic production or, of pig or, or goat. And that's not even often eaten. It's more saved for, uh, for economy re economic reasons. So these scenes with bushmeat are rampant. So what is the general rule of thumb? Whatever wildlife can be eaten, will be eaten. So if it's campers, slithers, swims, walks, crawls, burrows, or flies, there's a good chance that someone's going to want to eat it. Practically all forms of wildlife, from the largest emblematic mammals to the smallest insects, are avidly consumed throughout Central Africa. Hmm? People from around the world consume animals in ways that may be surprising or even repulsive to people outside of a given environment. Choices are based on cultural attachment, biological needs, and psychological perceptions. And here, you know, it would be extremely pretentious to not agree with Mahatma Gandhi who said that the greatness of a nation can be judged by the way its animals are treated. You know, I have to think through this a little bit because just because people kill them and eat them doesn't mean that they don't respect them. And I was actually doing some gastronomical research in a bushmeat restaurant in Brazzaville. I was eating a porcupine in a lemongrass sauce and nearly broke a tooth on a pellet. So I asked the owner, I said, I'm surprised that, you, that these animals, that uh, porcupine are hunted with, with rifles because usually they're trapped. And she said, yeah, well, I actually prefer buying porcupine that was shot because the animal suffers less than if it stays or lingers in a trap. So, you know, this statement by Gandhi, let's nuance it. Mm. So what are we talking about? We're talking about huge boa constrictors, facochet, so uh, bush pig, monkey. These are all images that I've taken uh, during my different travels, so Jonas, so your ownership rights should be okay. 
this bird here, our colleague can give us the scientific name for it. The way it's hunted is actually pretty brutal because hunters g climb up the trees, they put glue near the nest, and then when the animal can't move, they, they go get it. Hmm? Uh, red river hog, crocodile, dwarf crocodile. This is actually an interesting image because you can see the fish hooks in the upper right hand corner and in this lower left hand corner the uh, the 12 gauge shotgun and of course the dwarf crocodile in the middle. Mm. This is also an interesting photo because you have th the small pile of meat on the lower right hand corner which is the internal organs and so the internal organs are reserved for the, el the male elders or the chiefs, and that's in a different category of meat than uh, the other parts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, smoked monkey is obviously something that you see in all of these markets. Mm -hmm. Livelihood strategies. These people make their livings by hunting and preparing meat along the roadside. This is within the Luki Reserve in Lower Congo. This is actually an interesting photo uh, of turtles in Kisangani. Previously, women in the Kisangani area did not eat turtles. There were taboos against this. The taboos were v articulated by men that wanted to save the good meat for them. Women didn't eat these turtles, and then they realized as Kisangani became more and more cosmopolitan, other ethnic groups coming into the city, different cultural habits. The women that never ate turtle before saw other women eating them and they didn't have any problems during delivery at birth because that's what the men were saying, that if you eat a turtle, the way that the head of the turtle goes in and out of the shell, it's going to be the, the uh, newborn baby going back and forth into the womb. So a lot of these things have changed because of cosmopolitan attitudes. You're probably familiar with the very famous analysis of Marcel Mauss about what is a total social fact. It's an activity that has implications throughout society in the economic, legal, political, and religious spheres. And bushmeat clearly is a total social fact in Central Africa. What's it called? So in French, it's quite easy because it's la viande de brousse. But in the English-speaking world, it's ideological and political. S those that say bushmeat are sometimes accused of being derogatory. And there's a, a donor trend now towards saying it's wild meat. Others say game meat. But in Central Africa, it's just simply nyama. And my colleague Jackie Manyaki has emphasized that this is a linguistic blur is that correct, Jackie? In the sense that meat and animal is the same word. So this is also quite telling that meat and animal is called the same thing. Mm. So what's the place of bushmeat research at the Africa Museum? First of all, it's an interdisciplinary theme. It's a window to understanding co contemporary dynamics in Central Africa, which is obviously a priority for the museum. It is a social and environmental challenge which impacts development priorities, also a priority here. And it opens and reinforces the museum to a new range of in international partnerships, Wildlife Conservation Society, ERAIFT, National Science Foundation, the United Nations World Conservation Monitoring Center, etc. And it capitalizes on my own previous forest governance and urban sociological research. Hmm. Wild meat is also high on the international donor agenda. So we have millions of tax dollars and euros and well-endowed philanthropic grants are spent annually on trying to curb the bushmeat crisis. The world's rich and famous, Leonardo DiCaprio, Ted Turner, Warren Buffett, also support wildlife conservation efforts in Central Africa. And you've probably seen yesterday that Jeff Bezos has just granted 10 billion US dollars to work on climate change. 
So 10 billion, that's a 10 with nine zeros. It's a lot of money. And so a research institute like ours also has to be attentive to global climate change mitigation issues. And here, obviously, bushmeat is a big part of this because already in the early 1990s, Kent Redford was the first to label what was now called the empty forest syndrome, which is similar to what we hear in Europe, no bees, no farms in Central Africa, no wild animals, no forest. So in the very, very long-term perspective, the elimination of wild animals from the forest is gonna have a major, major impact on climate change. Hmm. What are the takeaway messages? First, urban consumption of bushmeat has increasingly devastating effects on the fragile web, fragile web of biodiversity, village economies, community well-being, and health. Hunting is a persistent phenomenon driven by rapid urban population growth, shifting household dynamics, and I won't have time to go into all of the, the subjects that I'm actually researching, but just one quick word about shifting household dynamics. Kinshasa, 13 million people today, is going to be the 10th largest city in the world by 2030. And when you think about the, the pull of a city like Kinshasa from the forest, it's overwhelming. And one of the things that we're looking at now is Shifting household structures has an impact on bushmeat consumption because people living under the same roof do not have the same rights to food. And so the, the household, whether it's the, the parents, the children, the grandchildren, the nieces and nephews, or the children of single daughters, this has an impact on the very rapid rise of street food in Kinshasa and bushmeat is part of this street, street food phenomenon. Mm. And hunting is also driven by economic opportunities and cultural attachment. Mm. Despite efforts by donors, researchers, conservationists, and national governments to reduce urban bushmeat consumption, the region's forests are being emptied of wildlife. What, how much meat are we talking about? Hmm? Central Africans consume between five and six million tons of bush meat annually. Now, these figures are not done by some random researchers uh, reading through the tea leaves. These figures come from the big names, the silverbacks of bushmeat research. John Farr from Manchester University, Robert Nazi from C4, and David Wilkie from the Wildlife Conservation Society. So what's five million tons like? Brazil, the world's second largest beef producer after the US, produces 12 million tons of beef per year. So we're talking about half of that huge beef production is eaten as bushmeat in Central Africa. Now, to make the comparison a little bit closer to home, Belgian annual pork production is 330 tons. And Belgium is a pretty big um, uh, producer of pork. So we're talking about a lot of meat. Uh, a few comments on framing the bushmeat crisis which is ecocide for environmentalists. Eating wild animals is just a normal way of life for many people in Central Africa. And I actually love the title of this PhD from University of Liège, La viande des uns, la faune des autres. Uh, so for what people want to eat, it's just ordinary meat, where for others, the conservation world, it's wildlife. Hmm? One of the big things that we're working on is behavior change efforts, because that's the big game in town. And so how is this being done? It's through law enforcement. So that's ranger training and adapting legislation, supporting judicial due process, awareness building. Uh, WCS with partners is uh, carrying out a big campaign now in 
Kinshasa in Brazzaville, it's the Kibra project. Alternative livelihood strategies, and here I put uh, that in uh, inverted commas because there's so much effort at trying to give economic opportunities to people to do other things than hunt, but in fact, they're not really alternative, they become complementary, you know, like beekeeping or sowing. People are not gonna change or uh, drop a lucrative economic activity to do something else. They'll adapt that other thing, but they'll either combine or put their nieces or daughters in that other economic activity. So it's not really alternative, it's complementary. There's also a lot of community involvement in many of these things that worked quite well in East Africa and Southern Africa, about benefit sharing, but this is mainly through ecotourism, and community policing, which is actually something that's quite promising because communities themselves are interested in keeping out commercial poachers from their lands because they're being deprived of their proper source of meat. Mm? So why is behavior change such a challenge? Because consumers believe that eating bush meat when affordable and available is quite simply normal, desirable, and commonsensical. This perception of ordinariness is a serious challenge to sustainable wildlife management policy because it is difficult to nudge behavior change for something that is not perceived as being unhealthy, illogical, or wrong. Conservation gurus have thus far been unsuccessful in giving a convincing answer to Central African consumers who ask, why shouldn't we eat it? And then you have another dimension here, which is wild animals are a gift of God, so we'll always be there. Now, all of, this, all of the uh, sentences in this presentation, which are in italics, come from uh, direct quotes. Mm -hmm. So this is something that people believe that bushmeat is a gift of God. It's going to be there. Mm -hmm. So how do I actually personally go about doing this research? So I'm an advisor to this uh, wildlife conservation Kiba urban bushmeat initiative. We have a global challenge research fund project with WCS and Echaift. GCRF is a British, well, it's a 15 million, 15 pound grant. It's big money. Echaift has a very, very small part of that. It's 50 partners worldwide looking at global trade patterns of commodity. Wild meat is about one third of this, so it's quite a big investment. Synthesis of available published in gray literature and extensive qualitative field interviews. Mm. Well, I've talked to hunters in Luki. I've talked to researchers in the Lakateli Community Reserve who are actually studying uh, the hunting of dwarf crocodile discussed this with ICCN rangers in the Kokolope Reef Forest. And you know, from uh, a historical research perspective, it's actually pretty funny because sometimes you think you close a research chapter and then it comes back to haunt you. you know, this is work that I already had published in 1999 with Pierre de Marais when we would, uh, had a big EU-funded project about wild meat. So for the young researchers, you know, save your notes. You never know when they're gonna come handy again 20 years down the road. Huh? So what are my research sub-themes? First, urbanization and demography, hunting, the culture of consumption, bushmeat and health, conservation versus development, deforestation in a shrinking habitat, eating out in Kinshasa, and policy design and law enforcement. Now, when I, when I was designing this presentation, I hesitated to between doing a deep dive into one of the themes or giving you a few general slides about all of them. So I chose the, uh, the second option was just, just to give a, to touch on what are the main research themes. Now, the other thing that I should emphasize is that I'm not a bushmeat specialist, but Without false modesty, I'm kind of a good generalist that can tie in a lot of things that the real specialists don't have time to look at. Mm. 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 Now, 
urbanization and demography. You know, when you look at the figures for the DRC and other countries in Central Africa, there is very, very high growth rate. DRC, 3.2 growth rate per year. That's very, very high. I don't know exactly in how many years that means that population will double, but it's quick. Kinshasa alone is really on target to be the 10th largest city in the world in a short time. The other column that's interesting is the rural-urban shift. In a s look in Gabon, 90% of the population lives in two cities. Other, city other countries as well, there's a major, major trend towards leaving the forest and living in cities, and this will have a major impact on urban bushmeat consumption. One Cong Congolese, Republic of Congo sociologist gave me this assessment. The city is like a huge open mouth, always hungry and never full. And so when you look at these figures and see how many people are going to be flocking to these cities, this is a telling harbinger of not good news for wild animals. So. Many of the challenges facing wildlife conservationists lies beyond their control. Urban settlements are increasingly gnawing away at a fragmented forest mosaic. So the future of tropical forests in Central Africa, so necessary for the future of the region's wildlife, depends on city dwellers. Hmm. Next theme is hunting, so hunting in transition. The hunting of wild animals in Africa precedes recorded history, goes back at least 100,000 years. And hunting scenes figure in the oldest known artistic representations, pa the Paleolithic cave paintings of Altamira and Lascaux. Hmm. Hunting had been largely sustainable for centuries in Central Africa and proves a deep local understanding by people of ecological dynamics. During periods of uh, 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 when females were gravid, they wouldn't hunt the females that fish during that time, or that laid traps for other uh, for that hunt for for male young males. But people understood these dynamics well. But this is changing. So even though there was the deep understanding of local ecological dynamics, local extirpation of large-bodied, slow-reproducing species is well documented, at least for the past hundred years. So extirpation is a word that I didn't know before. It refers to the, the elimination of specific species in a specific context. It doesn't mean the species itself is threatened but it disappears from a specific area. Hmm. Massively unsustainable hunting of wild animals is relatively recent and has been a gradual process, exacerbated in the past few decades by commercial hunting for urban markets. Uh, hunting, this is actually a terrible photo because you can see that this young man is selling cables used to attach logs that have floated down the Congo River. So he, they either steal or buy these pieces of cable, and then they unravel them. And so you can see the frayed bits here. This is what is used for making hunting snares. Hmm? So in the past, snares were made from vines or lianas, and now they're metallic and they're uh, have a very devastating effect on wildlife. Modern hunting is a source of intergeneral conflicts. And here's quite a good quote from, from an elderly villager that I talked with. We never hunted young male animals before, but today our young men hunt whatever they can get to get money. Kill, kill, kill. They just don't care. They don't think about the future. They say we're old-fashioned. They want change. Envy leads them to steal and hunt. When they see someone from Brazzaville with a new style of trainers or backpack, they do whatever they can to get money to have the same. Their desire becomes obsessional. And so the perfect example of this is the village kid 
he thought he was so cool with his trainers and his backpack and his cap. These are the kids that have completely abandoned traditional uh, hunting techniques. And this is one very, very telling figure. These dwarf crocodiles can reach a price of 35,000 CFA francs. But hunting these dwarf crocodiles is a specialized task. You have to know what you're doing. But what these young boys do is they go collect the eggs, which they sell for 200 CFA francs. So you can see that this question of sustainability is completely absent from their, from their world logics. They've, someone else mentioned, this quote I think is quite interesting, today isn't yesterday. The cash economy came to us like a lightning bolt. In the past, it was forbidden to sell animals from a collective hunt. The meat was distributed throughout the village and the choice cuts were offered to the chief, those uh, internal organs that I showed in the previous slide. Today, money confounds our relationship between humans and animals. Yes, really, modernity hit us with brutality. You know, it's this old guy that went into his, his hut and came out with this old spear that he had got from his father that was used for the collective hunt with nets and dogs. That hasn't happened in decades. And he told me, you people in Europe have books that you want to pass down to your children. That's a way of sharing knowledge. I want to save this spear for my children so they'll know how things were in the past. Papa Calvin, really friendly guy. Culture of consumption. So bushmeat is obviously food, but it is likewise a cultural reality with profound cognitive associations. We often hear things like this. A man has to eat meat to be strong. Or, if I were at a party and had the choice between fish, chicken, goat, or red river hog, my choice without thinking for a second would be the hog. Hmm? Hmm? Serving meat is good etiquette and is a means of showing respect. It's associated with the desire to please, reward, honor, show appreciation, or obtain favors. A Congolese colleague mentioned to me that his wife, who had slept with another man, tried to make up for it by preparing a nice dish of bushmeat for him. Ingurgitating the flesh of an animal is a way of assimilating its perceived characteristics. So here, for example, if a rich man in Brazzaville wants his pregnant wife to give birth to a strong young man, he has to get gorilla meat for her to eat. Hmm? Now, you may not realize it, but many of your Congolese colleagues, some here maybe even uh, who are present, their first bath is with bones of chimpanzees or other primates because by giving the first bath to a baby with a bone from a primate, that means that they become agile and they adopt the characteristics of cleverness as well. So there's a lot of these cognitive things that are associated with not only eating the meat itself, but everything that that represents. This is probably the biggest challenge for conservation behavior change strategists because they just can't get around the question, is bushmeat luxury or is it common fare? And both answers apply to different contexts. The motivations are quite contrary. Some people say they eat bushmeat because it's cheap and available. Others crave it because it is rare and expensive. The taste of liberty and the taste of necessity is also something that's relevant here. And this is something that in his famous book, Distinction by Pierre Bourdieu, he made this, he, uh, made this association. Taste of liberty, taste of necessity. And this was, this was articulated by one of my respondents who said, 
we are not free to choose what we eat. We have to eat what's available. Hmm? Holy Bible, what the heck does this have to do with it? It has a lot to do with it, huh? Uh, I missed something here. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Oof, huh? <laughs> so, anyone is a Bible reader here? Chapter 1 of the Corinthians, 1025. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. The overwhelming expansion of born-again churches throughout Central Africa means that the Bible is the book that is most widely read. No book is more widely read in Africa than the Bible. And people pay attention to messages like this for self-serving reasons, especially women who were largely not allowed to eat bushmeat. Now they can tell their husbands or they can go to the market. Bible says it's okay, I can do it. So in other words, born-again churches are actually in the process of doubling the number of potential bushmeat consumers through messages like this. Hmm? Actually, this is something that even Homer Simpson knew about. If God didn't want us to eat wild animals, why did he make them out of meat? Hmm? So he actually knew about the, the linguistic, uh, linguistic blur between nyama, wild animal, and meat. Hmm? Now, this is obviously Photoshopped, but it's not Photoshopped by me. This is something that someone sent to me. New Year's, bonne année, bonne fête. If you want to have a good party, you know you have to eat a lot of meat. Well, the funny thing is that this came from a female park ranger who also shares this perception. Mm -hmm. well, perceptions of wildlife conservation is also something that is difficult to get a handle on. This was from, I took this picture in Lakteli Community Reserve where it was rumored that there was a dinosaur there, the mythical dinosaur. And so this person said to me, when I was asking him about conservation and sustainability, said to me, well, I've heard that a dinosaur used to roam these parts, and I never saw it, and I'm not the worse for it. And now you're telling me to save the elephant for my children and grandchildren? Is it really going to make a difference to them? So, you know, these are the messages that are uh, very, very hard to convey to people that are reluctant to embrace the conservation message. Question here about our development in conservation reconcilable global priorities. There are two really diverging schools of thought here. And this is really a, a very crude summary. It is unrealistic to expect developing countries with weak institutions, inadequate infrastructure, poverty, and a democratic deficit to embrace the kind of green economy and sustainable development discourses advocated by high-income democracies. You know, and here, African elites often say, in Europe, you destroyed your environment to develop, and now you're telling us to save our environment but not develop. You know, this is all very stereotypical, what I'm saying here. The other thing is that if Africans do not adhere to this vision, their resources will be depleted, agricultural lands will become infertile, climate change will disrupt rainfall patterns and provoke nat natural disasters, and hungry, uneduca uneducated rural populations will, contribute, will continue to migrate to overpopulated urban slums. Now, right or wrong, there's a little bit of truth in both of these statements. So I'm kind of in between the road, but very, very critical of a lot of the strategies that are ongoing, and I subscribe to this view, that there is no better indicator of our inability to carry out long-term actions than the low success rate of development projects. Projects are poorly thought out. Local participation is 
is low, money seems to disappear. While Africa is only part of the problem, it does appear as a model of unsustainable development. Again, these are contentious statements, but I think that there's a little bit of truth in them. Now, my, my real strongly felt conviction is that it is extremely difficult to embrace sustainable development discourses when there are so few economic activities, what we really call wealth creation. Now, dense tropical forest in Central Africa offers very, very few economic op opportunities. How do you create wealth? No, you're not going to really create wealth through beekeeping or uh, getting women to, uh, to teach them how to sew. You know, there's a lot of these projects that try to get people out of the bushmeat trade, but it's not really wealth creation. And policy work here really has to take a shift, and it has to go towards more. Conservationists have begrudgingly adopted the responsibility to do development work, but they do it poorly, they don't know how to do it. The recommendation here is really that leave that to the professionals and work with development and economic opportunity professionals that will be able to identify options. Hmm. There's obviously the problem of a shrinking habitat from deforestation in DRC. Main driver is slash and burn agriculture. Hmm? Well, okay, the science is unequivocal. There's major, major uh, rates of deforestation. The highest in, uh, in Africa is in DRC. This is actually quite a good slide here from my colleagues at the World Resources Institute where and they've identified the top 10 countries losing the most tropical primary rainforest, and DRC is second on that list. Cameroon is also on that list, so Central Africa is, is heavily in, uh, a victim of this. Bushmeat and health, obviously this is really a hot subject. Huh? You know, I've just uh, picked up a few things from the internet uh, with respect to coronavirus. Selling and eating wild animals, disrupting ecosystems, and destroying forests all contribute to the risks of novel deadly microbes spreading into human populations. The wildlife trade may also have played a part in spreading the new coronavirus. Zoonosis, which is a disease transferred from animals to humans, this is a poster that I, uh, I took, a uh, photo that I took in Brazzaville. So you can have, uh, on the upper left, you see bats, which are associated with the transmission of Ebola. Gorilla, who were actually, there was major devastation of a gorilla population from Ebola. And your market women selling bushmeat. This issue was not only of concern to conservationists. There was a major conference in Brussels in December and it was organized not from a conservation point of view, but strictly from a public health perspective. Uh, uh, I didn't realize it, but there are 80 million people in Europe that have pets. And you can't believe how many of these pets are reptiles and pets that come from, uh, come from Africa. Uh, one thing that I did learn at this conference is that each year, 44 tons of meat from domestic or wild animals from Africa comes into Brussels National Airport. So again, that's a lot of meat. That was from a WWF report. Bushmeat and nutrition. Communities who live in forest areas and who depend on bushmeat for sustenance are also victimized. As wildlife levels diminish, so do their food supplies. One billion people depend on bushmeat for protein, most of the B vitamin complex and the minerals of iron and zinc. So again, you know, this is a really, really major global challenge. Commercial hunting for bushmeat markets reduces access to meat because hunters increasingly privilege selling meat for money instead of putting it into the household pot. 
and there's a lot of work being done by C4 now about uh, testing uh, child nutrition, and it's it's quite clear that children are suffering from the fact that their parents are not putting meat on the table in the pot; they're selling it, and so uh, nutritional issues amongst children is on the rise. I'm not going to go into this now. I'm coming towards the end, but I am looking also at the legal and policy uh, questions about bushmeat trade. I, c I couldn't help but put this slide in because I absolutely love it. Who are the old Congo Zaire people here that can identify what this monument is? Sir? The MPR. The MPR. So the... Mm, Le Mouvement Populaire pour la Révolution, you know, Mobutu's flambeau. So here, what do we have? We have the Africa Wildlife Foundation, who has replaced the MPR in saying now that, well, environmental NGOs are replacing the state. Huh? You know, it's quite a telling shift. Now, of course, the message here is that local governments are quite simply allowing international partners to deal with this. They're not doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. so, kind of the fun part of this work also relates to all of the legends and proverbs. You know, I love this one. It is useless to complain to the crocodile about something that the hippo did because they both live in the same murky waters. This is something about impunity in public administrations. You know, there's no sense... Uh, trying to complain to the hierarchical chief because they're all in it together. You know, there's another nice story that I heard in Salonga National Park about why bonobos flee humans, and that is because in the past, bonobos and humans lived quite peaceably in the same village, but bonobos loved to drink lotuku, local alcohol, and the drink in the drink, and they say, well, I'll pay you next week, I'll pay you next week. And then when the humans started asking the bonobos to pay for their drink, the bonobos fled to the forest. And so now when they see humans in the forest, they flee because they think that they've come to collect their drink money. Hmm? Hmm. So there's a lot with the legends and proverbs which are quite, quite exciting. Huh? Here you have a menu from a Kisangani restaurant where you can have antelope, boa, wild boar, porcupine, etc. Bon appétit and suggestions welcome. Thank you very much.